I love dragons. And in this video, we're gonna talk about how to make them as cool as possible in your tabletop roleplay game. An ongoing joke some of my friends have is that if there is a dragon in a movie or a game or a comic, I am automatically gonna love it. And you know, I'm sitting here trying to think of an example of a dragon thing that I don't love and I just can't do it. I mean, did you see that last episode of House of the Dragon? It was so cool. So yeah, this month on my Patreon, I'm making a guidebook all about dragons. I'll be using the ideas I'm talking about in this video to flesh out 12 unique dragons that you can drop into your games. Some will be fun NPCs, some are good for side quests, and others can be like the big baddie for your entire campaign. Right now, I'm sketching some dragons to figure out how I can make an interesting variety. I realize that I kind of draw the standard dragon and want to use this guidebook as an excuse to figure out how to make more unique looking dragons. So I'm using a gray Copic marker to figure out the basic shapes and then I'm going over the top in ink to test out some details. It's a fun way of sketching and because it's marker and ink I can't erase or fix anything so I'm not being as precious with this sketching. These drawings definitely aren't the final versions but they will be the basis for some of the dragons in the final guide. Okay, so what makes dragons so cool and how can we use them to their fullest potential in our games or writing? Let's start at the baseline. Dragons are basically dinosaurs, right? So they're big, they're scary, they're super dangerous. So the simplest way to make a T-Rex even cooler, let's add some wings, some armored scales, and have it breathe fire. Awesome. Now in terms of a baseline, that's pretty cool already. If you just need a big scary beast for your game, your dragons can be just that. But I want to take it a few steps further. So we could start by taking a look back. You know, dragons appear in stories and in folklore from all sorts of different cultures. There are tons of interesting tidbits that we could pull from old myths and legends and apply those to our dragons. Or we could go with how Wizards of the Coast presents dragons in D&D and the Forgotten Realms. They have the chromatic evil aligned dragons, the blue, green, white, black, and red dragons. And then they also have the good aligned metallic dragons. They're brass, copper, bronze, silver, and gold. Now this is kind of the type of monster design that I don't love. A red dragon is the biggest and the evilest and it breathes fire. They're super vain and greedy and all about destruction just because they're red. And that just seems a little bit reductive to me. But at the same time, both of these examples, the cultural and mythological dragons and these Forgotten Realms D&D variety have the benefit of creating some good player expectations. And sometimes that's a really, really great thing. You know, when a low level party sees a serpentine dragon with whiskers and a beard, they might know that it's some sort of ancient storm god. Or if they see a giant green dragon flying overhead, they might realize that they are being hunted and should expect to get hit with some poison gas at any moment. This sort of telegraphing of expectations can be a really useful tool to ratchet up the tension in your game, but I think dragons are already so iconic and dangerous that their mere presence is terrifying enough. So why not play with some of those expectations and make some more interesting and unique encounters? So the thing I'm gonna steal is that baseline that all dragons are super dangerous because they're big, powerful beasts. They can grow super big and live to be super old and ancient. But like I said, let's take it a step further and have them be intelligent too. A big beast that is also way smarter than you, now that is intimidating. I'm going to leave the whole color of the dragon equals its alignment stuff behind. 
I think it's more fun to have the players figure out if the dragon is going to eat them or not. And, you know, they should have to interact with the dragon and not just look at what color their scales are. Maybe a dragon's color has to do with what environment it lives in. So green dragons live in forests, silver dragons live on mountaintops. You know, they've adapted to the environment over the centuries. That's kind of a cool idea, but for my game, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I like the idea that dragons are somehow innately magical. You know, this adds even more dimension to them. They're big and scary, they're super intelligent, and they're powerful sorcerers. In my world, they aren't quite gods, but they are like maybe one step below. Maybe they were like the very first creatures to exist and are these manifestations of magic in the world. This makes them feel very powerful and also makes them feel properly ancient. So let's see, maybe there's a black dragon that is the manifestation of necromantic magic. It breathes toxic gas that melts flesh and its horde is a massive pile of bones that it can animate into an army of skeletons. Or maybe there's a bronze dragon that lives underground and clears out huge caverns with its thunderous breath that's like like dynamite explosions and it uses abjuration shielding magic to keep the caves from collapsing all while it's collecting its horde of precious gemstones. Of course, we don't have to stick to standard colors. One of the dragons from my Patreon book is a purple dragon that collects every type of creature with these binding spells and collects them into his own personal zoo. Or there's also this crystalline dragon that is the richest being in the world. It's super evil and conniving and uses divination magic to make sure it always has the upper hand. And this gets to the main way of making cool dragons, or really the main way of making cool NPCs or monsters in general, and that is to just make them unique. So sure, there might be other crystal dragons out there, but Magnificus, the richest dragon in the world, has a specific purpose in the game. He's one of the big baddie style dragons in this guide, and you know, what makes a better villain than one that takes advantage of people that are less fortunate for their own gain? But you know, he's not just some regular villain, some rich human. He's a super powerful dragon that lives in a floating palace and frequently breathes freezing vapors and turns his enemies into frozen statues. Maybe the players don't even realize that the person behind all the failing crops and deforestation is a massive crystal dragon. So when they figure out how to get up into this floating palace and see all the frozen people everywhere, then see this, this powerful and pompous dragon sitting on a diamond throne who also already knows that they're coming because of their divination magic the players are going to be blown away. Maybe literally blown away. And then on the flip side, there's also Demersus, a gray dragon. He was a pirate once, then started giving away all of his gold in attempt to find new friends and, and a new crew for his ship. And now he's just this depressed and magicless dragon. Or there's Belarior, a pink dragon that hunts the dead. Or Ethor, a dragon with iridescent scales that can teleport to different realms. Or Emot, the bookworm who is the head librarian of this great big library and can answer any of the player's questions. Just giving the dragon some interesting powers, a specific place to live in the world, and a name goes a long, long way. Speaking of names, for my dragons, I like to use words that reflect their character, and then I translate them from English to Latin. Sometimes I smash multiple words together or just add a few extra syllables. If it feels right for the character, it can be one of those on-the-nose names like Magnificus. And other times I try to make it a little more subtle and just have it sound cool like Sylvambula, Keeper of the Bear Dew. So yeah, I just really love dragons. I, I named my first published adventure Dragon Town. Talk about all the no's. Uh, but y you know, describing them, knocking down trees as they land in front of the party, or demolishing buildings with a single swipe of their spiked tail. 
It's, it's just awesome. They're automatically intimidating foes, but we can make them a lot more interesting by tying them into the history of our world. And while working on this dragon guidebook, I found it really helpful to come up with a fun concept for a super powerful creature, like someone who can travel through time, then I just dragonify it. So Tempuriat has reflective scales and breathes this mist that slows down time. Then I go the extra step of asking why this creature is like this, how does it affect the world around them, and who would be interested in interacting with such a cool and powerful dragon. If all of this has sounded interesting to you, definitely check out my Patreon. I release monthly guidebooks and tabletop role-playing game adventures over there. I put a ton of work into these books and I love shipping them out every month to my wonderful patrons. There's also a digital tier so you can get the digital version of all of these books I've been making for the past year plus. Let me know if you have any memorable dragon encounters from your game down in the comments. Thank you so so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. See ya!